focus on this one is to learn more about memory. Um, so have you ever reminded a child to hang up a coat or had to remind them to take out the garbage? Um, have you yourself ever said, uh, oops, I forgot? Um, you know, we all have those moments of like absent-mindedness um, and they, they happen throughout life. Uh, when we're younger, forgetting something, you know, wasn't, wasn't anything that we even noticed. It's not something that you dwell on. But as people age, uh, people begin to worry that there's something more going on. Um, so if they miss a lunch date or can't remember the name of a restaurant, um, they're afraid it's signaling that something more serious is happening. Um, forgetfulness can signal a serious a problem, but not always. Um, with Advancing age, many people experience minor changes in memory and most compensate for those changes without any interference to the quality of their lives. Um, this is referred to as what we call benign forgetfulness. Um, and it's really a normal type of forgetfulness and um, it can be really frustrating for people, um, but it doesn't really hurt anything. Uh, forgetting to pick up a gallon of milk or leaving your jacket somewhere like at work um, are kind of like examples of benign forgetfulness. You know, again, it's not going to hurt your everyday life, but it's kind of frustrating. You might have to go back to the store, you might have to go back to work to get that jacket, but um, it happens. And I'm sure most of you have experienced the same kind of benign forgetfulness. Um, throughout the workshop, we're going to challenge your brains with different intellectual activities um, because they are good for your brain. Um, and so, when we do teach this to our participants, we do encourage them, if they do have any concerns about their memory, to have a conversation with their doctor about that. Um, we always start this uh, one off with a handout um, that's part of your, the workbook, and we do a little kind of um, TV trivia, and it's called What Are You Watching? Um, and so they have it when they first come in. And so when we do this activity, um, if people want to kind of chime in on the chat box, um, you ask them to think of a TV show that has the word in it. And um, so sometimes people will think of movies that have the TV or have the word in it, but we're really focusing on um, TV shows. So does anybody have an answer for impossible? So such as like Mission Impossible. Um, how about company? And again, we're, we're thinking back here. Oh, Kim Possible, very good. And there's lots of, um, lots of these have more than one answer too. So, um, so think about that as well. Three's company, very good. Um, how about Barney? And friends, yep. Think about that purple dinosaur. Also there's um, Barney Miller for an older crowd. Um, how about incredible? Hulk? Yep. Um, heroes. And the Incredibles, good. Hogan's Heroes. Mm -hmm. How about Welcome? Back Cotter. All right. Captain? Hook? America? Kangaroo? All right. Um, dark. You guys might be all too young for this one. Good, Dark Shadows. Um, junction. Very good, Petticoat. American, there's a ton of these, ton of answers for American. American Dad. Any other answers for American? There's usually lots of answers for American. Greatest American Hero, <laughs> Gigolo, Idol. All right, lots of answers there. Uh, color. Movie in the color purple. Think of a TV show. Can I think of In Living Color? Absolutely. Um, legal. Yes, Boston Legal. Um, Jones. Legally Blonde. Yep. Another movie there. Anybody have one for Jones? Um, we have Barnaby Jones in there. Um, how about Brown? Usually a couple for Brown. Indiana Jones. Yep.
Anybody watch, uh, yeah, Murphy Brown? <laughs> Anybody watch any court TV? Oh, yeah. I think there's a judge, Joe Brown or something also. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yep. Um, seeing for, or, oh, I just gave it away. Sorry. Sun. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next one. <laughs> Anything for sun that you can come up with? There's a couple of them. Sanford and Son. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get my three sons. How who about cares if we add an S, right? What? I said, who cares if we add an S? We're not picky. Absolutely, not at all. We just want people to, you know, do a little brainstorming here. How about loves? Yeah, everybody loves Raymond. Uh, Beverly, there's usually a couple of them for this one. Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hillbillies, 90210, mm -hmm. uh, Love Boat, yeah, great, there's another one, um, Family, there's usually quite a few for Family, Family Guy, Family Ties, Family Affair, All in the Family, all right, how about King? Family in Focus, King of Queens. Great job. Yeah, lots of different ones that you can do there. Um, all right. So that's just something we kind of get people thinking about um, to get them, you know, some recall, challenge their memory. Um, we also tell people that, um, you know, not to get frustrated if they're not a TV person. Um, so with a lot of the activities, you know, if it's not something that you are interested in or pay attention to, then it's not something that you're naturally going to be, um, you know, good at. And so we don't want any of the activities to challenge anybody or to, for them to get, or we do want them to challenge them. We don't want them to get frustrated by them. So it's just an activity that we start, we open with. So, um, you know, just get people thinking. Um, today in this sec this lesson, uh, we talk about the different types of memory. Uh, we re review lifestyle choices that are good for both the brain and the body. And then we talk about strategies to help lessen that everyday forgetfulness. And so this is good for anybody at any age. Um, and so this is where I am going to turn it over to Molly. Thank you, Chels. Good morning, everyone. I am going to cover the first objective where we talk about different types of memory. And Chelsea and I came across this funny quotation, not only is my short-term memory horrible, but so is my short-term memory. And it is absolutely a facetious look at short-term memory. Um, we do hear people say things sometimes, oh boy, I can remember everything from childhood, but ask me where I parked the car, I'm always searching for my car after I leave a store. Um, it isn't that the person's short-term memory, I guess it is kind of a, a short-term memory blip, but it's more that the person was not paying attention to where they parked the car in the first place. So it was never uh, put into long-term memory for recall later. So we're going to talk now about the different types of memory, short-term memory and long-term memory being two of them. Within short-term memory, we also will talk about working memory, and within long-term memory, which I vacillate back and forth and kind of interchangeably refer to long-term memory as retrospective memory, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Various types of long-term memory are those you see on the screen as well, implicit, explicit, semantic, episodic perspective. It sounds um, kind of like uh, a mouthful, sounds kind of complicated, but these are pretty easy to understand. So if we start with short-term memory, short-term memory, whatever is going on in your noggin right now, you are using your short-term memory. Short-term memory is um, essentially your thoughts. It's the thoughts that go in, in, your, in and out of your head all day, every day. Short-term memory storage space is very small and 
the memories that we hold in short-term memory are fleeting. They stay there up to several seconds. So they are simply your thoughts, your conscious thoughts. Information in short-term memory is temporary and it may not be remembered unless it is transferred into long-term memory. And short-term memory can be words, it can be images, it can be numbers. So if we think about uh, parts of short-term memory or within short-term memory, there is working memory. Working memory is simply manipulating information in your short-term memory. So working memory is the ability to calculate, to manipulate information in some way within short-term memory. Its storage space, like short-term memory, is also very small, very, very, very small or short. And a good example of utilizing working memory is when you're trying to figure out the sale price of something, or if you're trying to think of what amount of tip you should leave after you've had a nice meal. For instance, if a top costs $40 and it's 30% off, how much does the top or shirt cost? When you're doing those calculations, you are utilizing your working memory. And it was kind of rhetorical, but the top would cost $28. <laughs> we usually have people who give us the answers. Okay, that is working memory. Now let's go into types of long, or, or what long-term memory is and then types of long-term memory. Long-term memory, in essence, is our storage space. Long-term memories within our storage space are more permanently there. Not for, some memories do fade, but it is our more permanent storage space. The information is transferred into long-term memory, um, maybe because it's deemed important and something that we need to remember. Sometimes we're not even aware that we've transferred something into long-term memory. It could also be that it is due to repeated exposure to information, that it is in, within our long-term memory. The storage space within long-term memory is vast. It is limitless. So we can never blame not remembering that we're too full up in our, in our minds. Our long-term memory storage space is limitless. It is also distributed across the brain and not in any single location. Some of the, of the information will stay in long-term memory indefinitely, but memories there may not always be permanent. Over time, some memories can fade. And a good example of this, I'm sure everyone on the call remembers celebrating your birthdays. You remember overall, you've had so many numbers of birthdays and you remember celebrating them. Even if you're not much of a celebrator of birthdays, you remember having birthdays. Now, does every birthday stand out absolutely vividly for each one of you? The answer to that is probably not. You may remember birthdays that um, were more memorable, whether they were memorable for a good reason or for a bad reason. Perhaps it was a surprise party for you Perhaps um, something unexpected happened on your birthday. Perhaps, you know, someone in your family was also born on your birthday. So it's, it's a memorable occasion, a memorable event. Chances are, though, that some of those birthdays over the years, the thoughts or memories of them have faded over time. So that's a good example of memories within long-term memory that, that can fade over time. So let's move on to, before we talk about types of long-term memory, let's move on to a little activity. And Chelsea and I refer to this as the U.S. President's Activity. I know last week we asked you to um, have pen and paper handy, and I'm sure you probably do since we've already done one little activity together. But even if you don't, you can use the chat box if you want. Within this activity, this is another recall type of activity. What you were, what, what are you watching was also a recall activity. We will talk more about recall in a bit. But within this activity, you see several boxes. There are 30 boxes to be exact. And there are the last names of 15 presidents housed in these boxes. And each box represents a part of a last name of a president. And what you are supposed to do is use the boxes to find the last names of presidents and you can only use each box once. So as an example, in the second column you see Nix, N-I-X. You know that is President Nixon, so you would 
find the ON, which is right next to it. You would cross out the NIX box, you would cross out the ON box, and write down Nixon. So there are 15 of them, and Chelsea and I wanted you to do a few more just by looking at the screen. Why don't you do that and look for the last names of U.S. presidents? And if you want to write them in the chat box, that's fine. If you don't, you could just do a visual look. Okay, this is a good activity for recall, and when we do this with our audiences, they really seem to like this activity. Now let's move on to types of long-term memory. Should we give them the answers, Molly? Um, sure, why not? If you had any, they were Adams, Fillmore, Nixon, Taylor, Clinton, Garfield, Arthur, Johnson, Hayes, Bush, Monroe, Tyler, Ford, Grant, and Taft. Okay, very good. We normally give about three minutes for that activity. Um, and with what are you watching as our audience members are entering the room, we hand them the workbook and we ask them to get started on what are you watching just for a little background. After three minutes, um, we usually give the answers. And if, unless people, I, with our audiences, I always ask, do you want me to give you the answers or do you want to work on it at home? So most people want the answers after three minutes. All right, types of long-term memory. You see here, uh, I talked about it a minute ago when the other slide was up, but retrospective memory is memory for past events or learned information. So it is um, very closely equated to long-term memory. It's memory for past events, things that we learn, episodes in our lives. Implicit memory is another type of long-term memory. It is also called procedural memory. In some references, it is also called non-declarative memory. It is a non-verbal type of memory. It's also sometimes called body memory. It's memory for one's motor skills. For, for uh, I always talk to audiences about implicit memory as doing without thinking. Anything that you do in this life without having to think about it. Um, taking a walk, drinking a glass of water, walking up and down stairs, combing your hair, getting dressed, things that you do automatically, or I say it is you on autopilot. Now, with implicit memory, um, I say typically, if it's you on autopilot, why do we sometimes question whether or not we've done something? And it is simply because it is you on autopilot. It is me on autopilot. You can take your medicine and question a few minutes later, ooh, did I take my medicine? You can drive away and think, ooh, did I turn off the coffee pot? So implicit memory, doing without thinking, is a marvelous part of how the brain works, but it is also troublesome sometimes if we can't recall that we've done something. Now, explicit memory is sometimes called declarative memory, and it is brought forth as memory in words or visualizations. So there are two types of explicit memory. One is episodic memory, the other is semantic memory. Now the root word of episodic, of course, is episode. So if you think in terms of episodic as uh, you recalling past events, places, times, or experiences in your life, or the episodes, the chapters in your lives. Anytime you have a story to tell, um, even what you had for breakfast this morning, or if you attended a wedding last weekend, this is episodic memory. These are episodic memories that you are bringing forth. 
Semantic memory differs. Semantic memory is acquired knowledge. It is learning. It is memory for recalling facts without necessarily a tie to a, a place, a time, or an experience. So knowing that Abraham Lincoln was one of our presidents is an example of semantic memory. Being able to do your times tables for seven or nine or 10 or six is an example of semantic memory. And um, if you're good at Jeopardy, if you watch Jeopardy and you're good at answering the questions, recalling answers to, to uh, trivia questions is another good example of semantic memory. It is acquired knowledge. Now lastly, we have prospective memory. Prospective memory is memory for future events, future um, intended actions, future activities. In other words, perspective memory, why don't we go to the next slide, Charles? Perspective memory is quite simply not forgetting to remember to do something. So these are, are common things that we all take part in. I must remember to drop off the dry cleaning, pay the electric bill, return the library book, order the birthday cake. I need to do this. Don't, I, I just can't forget. I have to stop here on my way home. This is perspective memory, memory for a future event or action, something that we want to do. And of course, we all have perspective memory fails, don't we? If you've ever uttered the words, oops, I forgot to do that. Oops, I forgot to call her. That is a perspective memory fail. Now, research we found varies a little bit as to whether perspective memory ability is impacted by aging, but it is clear that we all forget, and we all forget throughout life. There are prospective memory fails that are absolutely harmless. Um, it can be embarrassing, but if you said uh, you would bring a salad to Saturday's luncheon and you walk into the luncheon and you forgot the salad, that's a prospective memory fail. Prospective memory fails can also be very harmful. Um, you can leave the house without remembering to turn off the stove. I intended to turn off the stove, I forgot. Um, and when I was reading journal articles about prospective memory, one article uh, brought up the, the very unfortunate and very scary prospective memory fail that we all hear about at least once a year in the summertime a person, a parent who leaves a child in the car forgetting that the child was in the car seat and you know perhaps it was one parent who took the child to daycare who normally doesn't and simply forgot to stop and went on to work and forgot that the child was in the car. So prospective memory fails can absolutely be deadly as well. Prospective memory uh, can be, the tasks can be time-based or they can be event-based. A time-based task is something that is done at a particular time, like I'm going to meet my friend tonight at eight o'clock, or I need to check on that cake in the oven after 30 minutes. An event-based prospective memory task is something that we remember to do when an event happens. So you can be driving along down the street and you see the post office and then remember, oh, I need stamps or you pass the grocery store and you think, oh, I, we forgot to get milk yesterday, I need to get it today. So uh, prospective memory can be either time-based or event-based. Now, because there are so many times in our lives where we need to remember an intended action, it is pretty much our lives day in and day out. And a lot of us take care of um, prospective memory, um, avoiding prospective memory fails by doing things to help ourselves. And we will talk about that when we're into the strategies part. But for the most part, because we are human and because we do rely on prospective memory, we will have failures and we will drop a ball or two. That's why you see the juggler. Because it is life and life happens and we do forget throughout life, but we can try to work on making it better. Chelsea will now talk about a little bit of a review if you were on last week. Every one of our three lessons that you will hear over the next three Fridays 
talk about brain health contributors. So Chelsea now will review our brain health contributor research. Yeah, so if you're on with us last week, we really went into each of these in detail. Um, today we're just going to kind of um, mention them more. So um, as a review, healthy brains benefit from getting enough and good sleep. And so, um, you know, that's not just laying in the bed for, you know, seven to eight hours. It's actually sleeping that seven to eight hours in the bed, um, you know, resting, not, you know, not just laying there. Um, and then getting um, eating a heart healthy diet. So all the research says what's heart healthy is brain healthy. Um, exercising regularly. So making sure you're getting that as part of your, um, you know, daily movement, you know, working that in as, as you can. Um, managing your stress. Um, you know, there's no magic wand to take stress away from people, but having healthy outlets to managing stress. Um, as we all know, there's a lot of unhealthy ways that we can try to manage stress, um, but there's also healthy ways that we can help manage stress. And so really um, implementing those healthy ways of managing stress, you know, talking to somebody, um, exercise or movement, um, mindfulness, um, really incorporating those things into our lives. Um, having, you know, that social and emotional support um, there's so much literature out, out there right now that's really focusing on um, social connections and how important it is um, to engage in conversation um, and to have people who you, know, you have in your social circles that you converse with. Um, and it's uh, people who are socially isolated that are really kind of taking that um, mental dip. They kind of lose that uh, sharpness. And so it's really important for people to engage socially to keep um, their brains sharp. And then stimulating your brain with a variety of different activities. Um, you know, don't hang your hat on one thing. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, we ask people, what is it that you're doing for your brain health? And, you know, people are really proud when they're like, I do crossword puzzles or um, Sudoku or, um, you know, they have something that they, they do, and it's that one thing. Um, we'll talk more about that next week in FitWits, about being more well-versed and kind of well-rounded in the activities that you choose, um, because it is about a variety of challenging activities. And if you really like something, to increase the difficulty, um, because if you get too good at it, it's not really a challenge anymore to you. So. Um, you know, really think about that, increasing your difficulty if you enjoy doing something, you know, sometimes uh, newspapers when they have crossword puzzles, they get harder as the week goes by, you know, so increasing that difficulty. And again, it's not um, good to fully focus solely on any one of these lifestyle factors. It really is a combination of all of them for optimal benefits. Um, and brain health is something that we do throughout the course of our life. Um, uh, you know, we encourage people to think about this as, you know, lifespan. It's brain health is over our lifespan. Um, so now we're going to look more about forgetfulness contributors um, as we move forward. So why do we forget? You know, what is it that kind of causes us to have those um, benign forgetfulness moments or that, you know, absent-mindedness moments? Um, you know, what what does cause us to have those those moments. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is kind of that input and output. Um, you know, if you have good input, you're more likely to have good output. Just as if you have poor input, what are you going to get? Poor output, right? Um, so the first thing is we really need to um, pay attention. We really need to be in the moment. So when we're looking at input, we're talking about taking in information. So think about um, taking in information people are saying, taking in information in our surroundings. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're in conversation, we might be half paying attention. Um, so we kind of half get the gist of the conversation. Um, how many times have you had a conversation with a new person and you walk away and maybe a family member or coworker says, oh, who was that? And then you're like, um, and you don't remember their name and you just met them. It happens to everybody, but it's because we really weren't paying attention in the moment. And so we really need to focus on being present, being in the moment. Um, also, half the time 
we're thinking about, well, what are we going to say about ourselves? Because they're telling us about them. And as humans, we're kind of, you know, egocentric about, ooh, what am I going to say about me? Me, me, me. And so um, it's really important for us to think about, let me listen to what they say and capture what's being said, and then I'll tell about myself. Because I can guarantee you all know what you do for a job or, you know, a, about your history. Um, and so really be in the moment and pay attention. Um, or if somebody's telling you a story, you know, about what they did this summer, about a vacation trip or something, you know, really give them your full attention. Um, uh, a lot of times we might kind of be, um, you know, half listening because our minds are elsewhere. You know, we're thinking about all the things we need to do. We don't really want to listen about this vacation uh, story from somebody. We really think about, oh, I really need to go get something else done right now. And so we're kind of half present. Um, so kind of think about being more intentional and present. Um, again, you know, you're, you're, if you're not sinking good information in your brain, you aren't putting good information in that long-term memory, um, you're not really going to have good output later, right? So um, thinking about that output, retrieving information from your long-term memory um, can also be an issue. Um, as we get older, um, it's kind of a normal aging change that people do have difficulty recalling names of people and places. So um, proper names, so names of people and places of like restaurants, um, those kind of things. And it can be really frustrating for people. Um, but this is, again, a normal uh, part of aging. Uh, and we might say things like, um, oh, I just can't think of it right now, or it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, but slower recall of information is normal. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't remember it. It just means that we can't remember it like right in the moment when we want it or need it. Um, and oftentimes we remember it, you know, later. Um, it'll come to us, you know, a couple hours later. Um, and uh, there's a reason for that oftentimes. It's because um, in the moment when you're trying to, you run into somebody at the store um, and you're like, oh, I know them, I know them, I know their name, I can't think of it. What kind of emotions happen in that moment? Throw some emotions in the chat box for me. Nobody's had that moment where you couldn't think of somebody's name? All right, I'm getting some. Good. Embarrassment, frustration, panic, you're down on yourself, stress. All right, and how well do you think when you have those those uh, feelings going on, right? When you're embarrassed, frustrated, stressed, down, fear, right? You can't think clearly in those moments, right? All of a sudden, any clear thoughts in your brain have just gone out of the window, right? So that's why two or three hours later, when you're no longer stressed, embarrassed, panicking, you'll be like, you know, Mary Smith. Her name is Mary Smith. Why couldn't I come with, up with that when I ran into her at the, the grocery store? Um, so, um, you know, that's just something to remember also. Um, our recall isn't as quick or as, um, you know, agile as we would like it to be sometimes as we get older, but it is there. Um, but also, it leads us into the next one. We also have human considerations to think about, um, you know, and emotions is one of those that kind of gets in the way. Um, with us being humans, it can affect how clearly we think. Um, you know, we do have great intentions to remember, um, but, you know, things happen. So um, just like if you say, oh, I was going to get on that call Friday to listen to that brain health thing, but if it wasn't on your calendar, what happens? Sometimes we forget, right? So, you know, it's good for us to use strategies to help us remember, write things down, use calendars, because um, there are things that contribute to forgetfulness. Um, so what do you think are other examples of reasons that we forget since we're human? I mentioned emotions. What else could get in the way of how well we remember? You can throw them in the chat box. Yeah, lots going on. Too busy. Uh, yeah, big life events going on. So stress, tired, stress and work and life. Absolutely. 
Yeah, some other things also like health concerns, um, maybe medication side effects. Um, uh, you guys mentioned the, the worries or stressors. Um, also, think about if, any, if you have any kind of sensory um, deficit. So if you um, need glasses or hearing aids and are not using those assistive devices, it's good to use them because remember, if you're not getting good input, you're probably not going to get good output. And so you're going to get much better input if you can see things clearly and you can hear things clearly. So that's another one. Um, there also is um, what we call misremembering. So surprising, no, but memory is not perfect. Um, and so sometimes we want to fill in um, what we don't fully remember. Um, you know, so sometimes there might be a missing piece in that memory, and so we're, you know, telling a story, and, and then, like, you know, our memory just fills it in for us, and it might not be completely true or exact. Um, so maybe we embellish a little bit. Remember that fish gets bigger and bigger every time we tell the fishing tale. The fish was this big, and our hands get a little bit wider every time we, we tell it. Um, so sometimes the result can be false memory, um, so that does happen also. Um, and then also we have what we call environmental considerations to think about with memory. Um, and these are things that um, can impact our memory as well. So there could be things like distractions in your environment or um, lots of noises or interruptions or even things as simple as the temperature of the room. If you're too hot or too cold, you can't concentrate well, those can all get in the way of um, how well you're um, storing things and paying attention as well as how well you can recall them um, out of your memory. So all things to think about. I, so now, uh, Chelsea, I typically don't remember because I'm often distracted by my own thoughts. Yeah, that you know, too. I look like I'm paying attention, but I'm really not. I, I have my own thoughts, not necessarily what I'm about to say to someone else. So, you know, my input gets muddled because I am. You're elsewhere. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to kind of look at some strategies to assist with these everyday forgetfulness. Um, so the first one um, we're going to look at is um, perspective memory. So, um, you know, the whole, like, don't forget to remember, so that, you know, trying to remember something in the future. Um, we're going to look at paying attention, being, you know, more focused in the moment, and then we're going to work on our recall. Um, since so much of what we forget is due to that perspective memory fail, um, focus and attention um, issues and slower recall, here are some strategies that may help with these issues. So the first one is that um, perspective memory. So things that we want to do in the future or that intended action. Um, it doesn't, it shouldn't be surprising that sometimes we forget to do things. Um, so how can we make that better? Um, so, you know, one thing to think about is um, the tie around the finger is that universal sign um, that you want to remember to do something. Um, now, I'm not sure any of us are really going to tie a string around our finger and walk around. Um, but it is a good reminder for us that um, if we leave a visual cue, um, it could prompt us to remember to do something later. So, um, you know, whether it is making, you know, some kind of change or, you know, for me, if I need to bring something with me to work, I actually, you know, put the thing next to like my, my, my purse. So if I leave with my purse, I'm going to leave with whatever it is I need to remember to take with me. Um, you know, so think about things that, you know, you're trying to remember to do, if you needed to eat, write notes, um, use a little post-it note, make a note to remember, um, you know, whatever you need to do that works good to kind of give yourself a little memory nudge, um, that's how it is. And I always tell people, you know, try different ways and see what works for you. You just never know. Um, a secretary I used to work with, her mom used to use a hot pad and she'd throw it in the middle of her kitchen and that was her reminder that she needed to do something. Now, for me, that would never work in a million years because a hot pad in the kitchen just seems like a normal thing, right? But for her, throwing it out in the middle of the kitchen was her reminder that she needed to do something. It worked for her. So again, for me, that would never work in a million years. Um, so what kind of visual cues do you use to help you remember an intended action? Do you guys have some that work for you? You want to write them in the chat box and share? Chelsea, while people are writing, I'll tell everyone, my husband, when he wants to bring 
his lunch to work, his le the leftovers to work, he takes his keys and he puts them in the refrigerator on top of his lunch so that he has to go to the refrigerator to get his lunch in order to be able to start the car. Yeah, I love that story, Molly. I use that when I teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of lists and notes and calendars, phones, using your phones, rear view mirror in your car. Yep, you got to look back in that car mirror, rear view mirror. Put things in one place. That's a really good one too. Have one place for things. Yeah, great things. Great things. And I always, you know, we like to throw these questions out to the group because sometimes people will say something and it's a great thing that people can learn from and it works for somebody else. Um, we had somebody once say that they, um, you know, like how they kept track of whether they took their medicine or not is they put their pill bottle up, up, were, like sitting up in the morning and they flipped it upside down when they took their medicine. So it was upside down at night. And then when they took their medicine again at night, they flipped it back and then they knew it was ready upright for the morning again. So that's how they knew they took it or not. It was whether it was the right way for their morning pill or their nighttime pill. And so, you know, just a quick little flip of the pill bottle was how they knew if it was, if they'd taken it yet for that time of the day. Um, yeah, unless the help of others. I love that someone put that because that is actually one of our strategies to, yeah. to have a reminder from someone else. Absolutely. Um, also, if you say things, if you catch yourself saying things like, um, I'm going to make the call after the movie ends, um, or, you know, I'm going to do it, oh, I'll get up in five minutes and I'll take care of that. You know, if you have time right in the moment, do it right then, um, because oftentimes if you're thinking about it, it's a good time to do it. You know, if, if you're going to put it off, um, you might forget in the future. So putting off a task, thinking you, you'll do it later, it could be the perfect storm for, you know, a perspective memory fail. Um, so just something to think about. Um, so moving on to the second uh, tip here, really that, that paying attention thing. I know, and it sounds so simple sometimes, but um, we remember what we pay attention to. And that's why some people are really good at, you know, baseball statistics or movies or really good with, you know, knowing music and musicians. It's because they like it and they pay attention to it and, and it's, it's what they enjoy. Um, the same goes for being in the moment. Not that you have to really enjoy it, but you should pay attention to it if it's important. Um, this is just kind of an open question. You don't have to answer in the box, but how many of you had have left your home and had to go back and check on something before? And, and you're like, wait, did I turn off the coffee pot? Or I saw somebody say the tea kettle earlier, or, um, you know, did I, like for me, it's did I turn off my curling iron? Or, um, you know, did I lock the door? Did I shut the garage door? Um, and the reason that is, is as Molly mentioned earlier, we kind of have that body memory. And so you do it every day, your body does it every day. It's, you're an autopilot. And so you don't even pay attention that you're doing it. You do it, you're in your car, you're down the road, and then you're like, huh, did I or didn't I? I'm not really sure. And then you have to drive back because you don't want your curling iron all day on all day. You don't want the tea kettle left on. You don't want your door left unlocked. You don't want the garage door up. And so in order to kind of save yourself those little memory moments of wait, oh, I don't know, you, you want to really be in the moment. And so turn off that autopilot, you know, and really kind of be in the moment and, you know, like, Pay attention to the moment you shut the garage door. Pay attention to the moment you turn off the coffee pot. Um, you know, you, it's just, it's about really paying attention. Um, if you're in conversation, you know, really give the person your full attention. Um, don't be thinking about what is on your list of things you need to get done, or don't be diverted by your thoughts or other concerns and things you're thinking about. Um, you know, listen to the people, what they're saying. Don't be distracted. Um, uh, if you're learning, meeting somebody new, say their names back to them, um, you know, and also a good way to disengage that autopilot is to verbally say something. So, um, you know, when you're turning, like hitting the garage door, say I'm shutting the garage door or, you know, when you're parked in, I saw somebody say um, something about 
when you're on the phone, when you're parked. You, yes, when you're distracted by the phone, when you're parked, you can't find your car later because you're not paying attention. Absolutely. Um, but like if you park somewhere, you know, say I'm parked in the fourth aisle by the light, like if it's a big parking lot. So if you verbally say it, you're more likely to remember it because you engaged a sense. You engaged one of your senses, if that makes when sense. You do, when you do use your own verbal narration, you're disengaging your autopilot. You're yeah. taking yourself out of, I'm doing it without thinking, I'm using my body memory, I'm really not paying attention to my actions because I, my body did my body memory or brain just takes care of it you're disengaging it yeah so it's really good just to kind of be more in the moment um you know another really good tip that i heard from a participant was when they go into like a big box store they go up to the door they turn around and they find their car and they, they spot it out before they go into the store because when they come out of the store that is the view that they see so they take that extra moment to find their car from the door and then they go into the store to do their shopping because then when they come out they already they've already taken a snapshot they visualize that that view and then they know right where their, their car is so i was like that's, that's a good, good one suggestion. so um now we're going to do a little activity so what i would like you to do if you have paper with you um this is kind of a recall activity and so there's going to be 16 items and so i'm going to show you a slide I'm going to give you like, you know, 40 seconds or so to try to remember as many items as you can. Now, it's not going to be fun if you start writing them down when I show you the slide. So, um, you know, just kind of make, you know, number your paper 1 through 16. And then I'm going to see how many items you can recall. So, like, what did you pay attention to here? So, I'll give you a moment to kind of number your paper. I'm going to flip this slide. And then we're going to have you just look at the slide. And then I'm going to take the slide down, and then I'll tell you to try to do a recall event of how many can you remember from what was on the slide. All right, here we go. So you're just going to be paying attention to what's on the slide. All right, I'm taking it away. Now, write down as many of the items as you can that you can recall. Okay, 
Let's see how you did. Here are the 16 items. I'm gonna read them out loud. You can see how you did on your paper. Scissors, a change purse, puzzle pieces, yarn, ruler, tape measure, pliers, sunglasses, ribbon, a rubber band ball, coffee mug, another ball, shells, ticket stub, push pins, and a pencil. All right, so when looking at how you did or how you remembered things, did anybody have a strategy for how they went about remembering the items? Okay, focus on the big things, build a story with the items. Two items are measuring instruments, so categorizing them by the first letter of the word. I do what you said, you repeated the names of the items. I focus on each and looked at the whole clockwise. So you visualize, remember where they were, kind of a spatial visualization. Awesome. Those are all great ways to think about how to remember things with short-term memory. Um, so if you're trying to remember things, those are all things you can think of, like making associations, grouping things, and kind of categories, uh, visualizing them, um, alphabetizing. So sometimes people, when they're trying to remember a name, they go through like uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, trying to get to somebody's name as a, a, a cue to remember a name. Um, a number of things, one pencil, two tickets, three shells, creative. I have never heard anybody say that one, I like it. Um, and so I always, I always focus on the strategy of how people remember, not necessarily like how many things people remembered on this one, because really it's about learning strategies to remember things. Um, and so that's what I like to focus on when I do this activity with participants. Um, you know, to help them identify like what did they try, did it work, and then what did other people try, um, and then they can think about that, you know, for the future as another possibility. Molly, do you want to highlight anything? Yeah. I just had a perspective memory fail. I was talking along with you, forgetting I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're all human. Um, yes, I was going to say that these, I also focus on the strategies more when I teach because what people are essentially doing is they're finding a temporary, temporary way to remember something in, that they deem important in the moment. So you are finding strategies to remember, but chances are if next Friday out of the blue we said what was, uh, what were the items in the picture when you had to, to pay attention in the focus activity, Chances are you may not remember as many as you have this week because example of even though you were encoding into long-term memory, it isn't information important to you and won't stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. All right, um, now a little bit more about recall. Um, so throughout life, we mentioned earlier that we have trouble recalling or retrieving people's um, uh, names um, or places or maybe even things. Um, and again, at one time or another, everybody probably has had an issue of thinking of somebody they knew, they could even describe how the person looked um, or other details about that person, they couldn't re remember that person's name. And again, this is all normal age-related change um, where they needed that recall ability. Um, and recall is, you know, bringing forth information that they, they have in their brain, they remember. Um, it's frustrating and embarrassing when that information is not coming. And again, it adds to kind of that stress of not remembering. So now we're gonna do an activity on recall because um, you can challenge yourself with recall activities whenever and wherever. Um, and all you really need to do is kind of start, like think of a topic or category. And um, you can kind of think of a list, like you know, throw out a, a topic and then you can just kind of do free recall um, either on paper or in your mind. And so we're gonna do a free recall um, here. So again, if you wanna just kind of write one through 15 on your paper. Um, and again, in our packets, we have all these activities listed out and I'll kind of show you a pa the packet once we're done with the program. Um, but while you guys are writing out the 
um, 1 through 15. You know, this is just a great way to work on recall and practice it. And again, as with anything, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. It's just a, it's a good, you know, mental workout for you. So in this activity, um, we're just going to give you a minute to try to recall 15 answers in a category. Um, and so I'm going to choose a category and I am going to choose the category um, board games. So this might not be your favorite topic, but let's try it. So try to think of many board games as you can. So for example, like Monopoly, I'll give you number one, Monopoly. So think of as many board games as you can. Go ahead. All right, was board games hard? You can just throw up a yes or no up there. Or how many you got out of 15? Harder than I thought, okay. Yes, 11, nine. Okay, so yeah, you could just say maybe games, games kids play, that might be easier. Um, some other categories that, you know, you could throw out there, you know, uh, 15 sports teams. I wouldn't choose one sport because that would be really specific and hard probably. Um, 15 household appliances. So, you know, like a blender, coffee maker, washer, dryer, you know, try to get to 15, your vacuum. Um, 15 bodies of water. So in your area, in your state, and the world, you, I mean, if you think about, you know, somebody who's sitting in your program or if you would do it, you could think about doing, you know, rivers, lakes, oceans. I mean, you know, like really challenge somebody. Um, you could do 15 unisex names, you know, Jean, um, Terry, um, Pat. Pat. Yeah, like, like something like that, um, 15, you know, magazine newspaper titles or something, um, 15 restaurant names. Um, so anyway, um, these are all just kind of like suggestions. So you could kind of, any kind of free recall. Um, but we encourage participants to do this. Like if you're sitting at a restaurant waiting for your meal, you could do it with the people you're sitting there with. If you're sitting in an appointment and you're sitting in the waiting room and you're trying to kill time, you can just do it in your head, right? You could just try to like count through them and itemize things um, or do it with a piece of pen and paper. Um, it's just a good way to kind of get that brain challenged. Um, you know, and you can do a lot of them with names like 15, men's names with M or ladies' names with J. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, if you were on last week, we did it with you with the states. Eight states that begin with M, eight states that begin with N. Yeah. It's just a good list you can recall. It's just a really good way to challenge your brain doing the, the recall activities. Can I give one more suggestion, Charles? Yeah, when, please. When I do free recall with my audiences, I We'll have them do the 15 in a minute, but then I'll have them do 15 more. And it's when you do the 15 more or so many more, you know, it doesn't have to be 15 of anything. You could say 10, you could say 20, whatever. But when you are doing the further recall, that is when you're really reaching and when you're really looking into trying to utilize your long-term memory and bring your information into your conscious thought or your short-term memory. 
So the first 15 might be easier than certainly the next 10 that you might come up with. Yeah, so give it, give them a good, give people like a little push, you know, to, to try a little harder because it's good for the brains. Um, and then as we look at some additional tips for that everyday forgetfulness, um, you know, is it more difficult to multitask as you get older? Yes or no? Is it more difficult? Anybody wanna? Absolutely, it is. Um, research has shown that it is indeed harder for people to multitask as they get older. Um, so in order to complete you know, jobs uh, quicker and more thoroughly, we do encourage people to set time aside to focus on activities that require more attention or that are more complex. So things like paying bills or, um, you know, setting up medicine boxes or, you know, whatever somebody's working on that you really want them to do well and do thoroughly and not make a mistake on. Um, it's also good to keep pen and paper handy in strategic locations. Um, so note taking is a great reminder tool. Um, so have those notebooks in specific locations where you might, you know, find them useful. So I always encourage people to have one by the nightstand. Um, this is not only useful in general, but also it's really good for people who have trouble getting to sleep at night because they can't go to bed because they're afraid they're going to forget something. So a lot of people lose sleep because they're, they think of something, they're laying down at bed, and then all of a sudden something pops in their brain and then they're like, oh, I don't want to forget that. And then they stew on it. And really, it's good for people to do that brain dump and just write it down on a piece of paper and say, you know, call so and so tomorrow and then be done with it and then get a good night's sleep instead of sitting there for 20 minutes thinking, oh, I hope I don't forget to make that phone call tomorrow. I hope I don't forget to make that phone call tomorrow. I'm going to forget that phone call tomorrow. And you work yourself up and then you don't get a good night's sleep because of it. Or you get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and then on your way back to the bathroom, you know, you think of something like, oh, that's right, I need to, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. And then you stay up in the middle of the night because you're worried you're gonna forget whatever that was that you thought about. So it's really good to have pen and paper by your bedside, you know, maybe by your phone um, or by your favorite chair, um, someplace that you might think you might take notes. Um, but remember, if you are writing notes, they're only as good as they are if you use them and you can locate them. And man, I'm guilty of that one. Um, sometimes I'll take notes in a little notebook and I'll put it in my purse and I take it out of my purse and I'll leave it at work and then I'll be at home. I'll be like, where's that notebook at? <laughs> so you have to keep well, track of your I notes. Look what I wrote it on. I, you know, I remember it was something that was yellow or, you know, right. so, I really don't remember. Sometimes people are really are guilty of writing on a random piece of paper, the back of an envelope, you know, just something that they, they see it, you know. So it's, it's good to have like something specific that you use. Um, also the use of calendars, people mentioned that earlier, planners. Um, so those are all good reminders. Also, you know, they have the saying, two heads are better than one. Um, so indeed that's true. Ask for a reminder for somebody that you know that will help you remember to do something or will, you know, remember as well. Um, and then again, practice that art of paying complete attention when somebody's speaking, concentrate on being more fully in the moment. Um, don't speak until the person has finished talking. Um, everybody can work at being a better listener. Um, you know, those are all some really good, good tips uh, on, you know, helping that everyday forgetfulness. Uh, Chelsea, I have a funny story. There was a, it's not so funny, but it's unusual kind of combining that visual cue and keeping um, notes. A woman told me that if she gets in one of my classes, if she gets a thought in the middle of the night that she wants to remember something the next day, she takes one of her throw pillows off the bed and throws it into the middle of the room. And that works for her, but I would end up in the hospital cracking my head on something because I would forget that I put the throw pillow in the middle of the room. So um, we're not asking you to fix what isn't broken. If you do something that works for you, that's absolutely great. But these were just suggestions in case you do struggle with some of these benign forgetfulness problems. Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of like the whole idea of the hot pad, like the, you know, like mm -hmm. exactly. I laugh to myself when you said put that. the hot pad in the middle of the kitchen table, like like that, that's her reminder. I'm like, I do not know how that works, but it works. So mm -hmm. um, so today we kind of talked about different types of memory. Um, 
things that we can do to contribute to our own brain health. Um, and then we talked about those little hints for everyday forgetfulness. Um, and again, you know, we always encourage people, if you have any concerns about memory, you know, definitely talk to a doctor, um, you know, so it's, it's just good. It's just good practice. So um, again, um, this program is brought to you through um, NCRAN um, and our website is up. Um, we are adding things to it um, every day. So um, it's not completely fully there, but you know, we get more resources up there and more information. Um, so keep checking back. Um, and our webinars are on the first and third Friday or beginning next month, um, starting in October. So check those out as well. Um, I am going to put my email up if, don't get sick. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Brain Health series, um, once we're ready to um, put it out to the world, uh, feel free to send me an email now and we will add you to our list. Um, and uh, once we're ready, we'll kind of shoot out an uh, email and then share how you can access that information. Um, so you can contact me at clbyers, B-Y-E-R-S, at illinois.edu. Um, actually, I'm going to throw that in the chat box. And I'm going to show you the um, – it's in the chat box. So I would like to show you the handout really quick. Um, let me pull that up. You can just kind of see what that looks like. Um, it's on the screen, Charles. Okay. Um, so we go through the activity one, the what are you watching that we open the session with. Um, we leave space for people to take their own notes because we feel like it's better than us writing all the information in for them. Um, so they're not reading ahead. We'd rather them write down what they feel is important about the different types of memory. We have the activity two about the U.S. presidents um, in there. Um, also, the forgetfulness contributors. Again, they can take more notes. And then um, the activity of what do you see. So that was that recall activity of um, the balls and the ticket stubs and the pencil and the pliers and then activity four, the free recall activity where, you know, you can kind of pick out your own topic or we have some suggested ones in the script um, and people can try to think of 15 items um, in whatever category you find fun that day. Um, and then we go into the, um, a little bit more detail about each of the brain health contributors. Um, uh, because we do feel that these are very important for everybody. So, you know, getting quality sleep, the heart healthy diet, regular exercise, stress management, social connections, and intellectual challenge. So there is more guts in that because we do kind of breeze over that in, in this lesson. Um, unlike last week where we really went into each of these um, in much more detail. Um, and then we wrap up with strategies to assist with everyday forgetfulness and then a little extra space to um, take notes. We also have included on the very back a picture of what we show for the recall activity because um, sometimes when you're in a room, they're not well lit. If you're doing a PowerPoint, sometimes you don't have access to do a PowerPoint. Um, we do have this on the back of the handout so they can just look at the back of the handout um, for the time allotted and then focus on the picture and then flip over to the spot in the book um, and then do the recall there. Um, and so the picture is in the handout for that reason. So if you don't have the technology um, with you or if it's too bright in the room and they can't see the screen very well, um, the picture is on the very back of the handout, easily accessible for participants to look at and then flip to. Um, so. We do make every one of our workbooks. We have many lessons that we have developed together. Chelsea and I have developed many lessons together even um, outside of brain health. And we typically have workbooks like this that we develop. So A, they are interactive, but B, we leave a lot of open space for purposeful note-taking because note-taking is very good for the brain. You know, it reinforces what you're learning. So we do this very purposefully. Does anybody have any questions? about today's program. And you can unmute yourself as well. You yeah. Put it in the chat box. 
Well, thank you for spending part of your, um, um, I am going to be at NEFCS. Um, I'm presenting on a community partnership. Um, I won a national award for um, community partnership for my brain health, for, for this brain health series. I'm partnering with the Alzheimer's Association um, and our area health education center. Um, and so I'm presenting on the building the partnerships in the communities on the brain health stuff, um, but not necessarily on the content. So kind of more about building collaborations in communities. <laughs> we have presented at American Society on Aging uh, about our brain health series as well. Yeah, thank you though. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, so yeah, I am doing a little bit of, so people see a little bit about the brain health, but it's more, the focus is more on the building, how to build the community partnerships and kind of rural areas to reach more people. Um, so. I agree, Ellen, too. We, in fact, um, that is part of our plan to present this. We wanted to last year and then we weren't quite ready to, so it is our plan to present a webinar for NASCS as well. Yeah, thank you everybody for spending Friday morning with us. We hope you guys have a great day and a great weekend. And I don't know about you guys, it's pretty warm here in Illinois, but um, stay stay safe and think about all those uh, on the East Coast. Yeah, that's awful. Mm -hmm. We're jealous, Ellen. <laughs> we thought we were in Coolsville here and then it turned